More and more places are starting to require vaccines for employees, meaning either you get the shot or you get fired. Or you can claim a medical or religious exemption. But how do employers determine if someone's telling the truth about that? They do have the ability to, to question that person's belief system to seek additional information. And I know a lot of people who choose not to get vaccinated say it's a personal choice. But when hospitals are so full of unvaccinated COVID patients that they turn away people who need surgery, is it really that personal of a choice? And they're basically yeah. saying there's no room for us because of what's going on. And a superintendent in a tiny town in Eastern Oregon just got fired by the school board, apparently for requiring students to wear masks in class which is the governor's mandate, right? Here's the story. And I'm Dan Haggerty. It is the governor's mandate. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But hello, welcome to the story. All the ways to contact us at the bottom of your screen. Please use them. Tell me what's tell me what's on your mind. Let me know. Email us at the story at KGW.com. Find me on Facebook or Instagram or use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. Now, I do want to quickly mention something right off the top here. We've been keeping our eyes on a brush fire in the Dows. You can see some of the smoke on the sky cam the camera there. We don't do a lot of breaking news on this show, but whenever there's the possibility that people could be in immediate danger or be in the kind of the line of fire, so to speak, right now. We are going to talk about it. It's only about five acres, but we can tell you it's burning close to homes and people living southwest of 13th Street in that area are being told to evacuate and to do so right now. So if you're watching this and you are southwest of 13th Street, turn off the TV, head on out of there. All right, watch us on your phone or something. Uh, it's time to go. We're going to have much more on this at KGW News at 630 and we're going to have the latest for you at KGW.com. You can watch that right now if you're interested. In the meantime, let's turn to the big story. I do think a lot of you are going to have a lot to say about this one. Now, most state employees in Oregon and Washington, as well as K through 12 school staff and health care workers will have to be fully vaccinated against COVID by October 18th or risk losing their jobs, being fired, being being canned. Weekly testing instead of a vaccine is not an option here. It has to be the vaccine. We've been getting a lot of questions about what happens, though, if someone chooses not to get that shot and what qualifies for a legitimate exemption not to get the shot like this one from Jan. As an employer, do we have any ability or legal option to deny any employees religious exemption request for mandated COVID-19 vaccinations? Why doesn't the exemption have a mandatory verification process such as a confirmation by one's clergy? It seems this is a huge loophole for employees who are required to get the shot and now declining due to religion. Kristen Severance looked into this for us and joins us with tonight's Verify. We've been getting a lot of questions about the vaccine requirements for state employees, school employees and health care workers and a lot of questions about the exemption process. So we set out to verify this. What are the approved exemptions when it comes to the COVID vaccine? Well, there are two exceptions to the mandate based on new rules from the Oregon Health Authority. The first medical exemption, the second religious exemptions. But just because you ask for one does not mean you're going to get one. So let's kind of break it down here. Let's start with medical exemptions. According to Oregon's COVID vaccination rules, a person qualifies for a medical exemption if they have a quote physical or mental impairment that prevents them from receiving a COVID-19 vaccination. But just saying so isn't enough. You'll need to prove it by having a medical provider sign this form explaining why you should not get the COVID vaccine. For example, someone who is allergic to components of the vaccine may qualify. But requesting an exemption again does not mean it's automatically approved. All requests will be reviewed by employers and they could be denied. Now let's look at religious exemptions because they are less clear cut. The state of Oregon says a religious exemption can be claimed if someone has a sincerely held religious belief that prevents them from receiving a COVID-19 vaccination. In Oregon, you'll have to fill out this form describing your religious belief and how it affects your ability to receive a vaccination. We talked to Taylor Duty about this, an attorney at JJH Law who specializes in employment law she says employers are not required to accept all religious exemption requests at face value and they can ask additional questions. An employer does have a right to ask some follow up about 
the reasonable accommodation that the employer may be providing in order to allow that person not to get vaccinated, they do have the ability to, to question that person's belief system to seek additional information. Let's use Portland Public Schools as an example. Chief Human Resources Officer Sharon Reese says the district will closely review every exemption request. We will be reviewing that each religious exemption that is requested is uh, on, based on bona fide beliefs. Some states are asking additional questions on the request form itself. Take a look at this form from the Washington State Department of Transportation. It's based on guidance from the state's Human Resources Office. Like Oregon, employees who ask for a religious exemption will have to confirm that their religious belief prevents them from getting the vaccine. But the second question is interesting. It's more controversial. It asks employees if they have ever received a vaccine or medicine from a health care provider as an adult. Governor Jay Inslee's office said the religious exemption process is meant to consider appropriate details regarding how the religious belief prevents the employee from taking the vaccine. Inslee's office said the process is meant to be interactive and employees will have a chance to appeal a rejected request in many circumstances. Duty says it's vital that employers work with employees who request accommodations. Employers need to be careful that employees coming forth with sincere, genuine trying to understand if, if they qualify for an exemption or, or a reasonable accommodation, you know, to not retaliate against a, a, an employee coming forth in good faith. Okay, our next question. So what happens if employees don't get the vaccine or an approved exemption by October 18th? Well, according to the rules, they could lose their jobs. Now, even those who are granted an exemption may see their job change, especially if you're interacting with patients or students on a daily basis. Employers have an obligation to prevent the spread of COVID, and that could mean reassigning someone who is unvaccinated. If you have questions about the vaccine mandate or exemption, Exemptions, just let us know. Easiest way to do that, send us an email, verify at kgw.com. All right, thank you to Kristen. Now uh, let's talk about vaccines by counting them, right? More than 2.69 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose. That's 64% of the state's entire population. We're counting everybody. That includes everybody, even kids under the age of 12 who can't get the vaccine yet. We want to give you an idea of how many people who we live around are vaccinated in total. In Washington, more than 5.16 million people have gotten at least their first dose of a vaccine, which works out to be almost 68% of that state's entire population including kids. So you can see so a lot of people in both states who haven't gotten a vaccine yet. And I want to talk about some of the impacts that that is having and not just on the people who choose not to get the vaccine, but really everybody, our whole community. So let's turn and talk to Pat Doors for just a minute. Pat, you've been spending a lot of time focusing on our overwhelmed hospitals. Let's talk big picture first. Can you give us an idea of what our hospital capacity looks like right now? Yeah, it's still pretty slim, about 1,162 people in the hospital this afternoon and this evening, 6% uh, availability for ICU beds, 7% for all non-ICU beds. That's pretty thin. Now, we've been getting a ton of emails, a lot of them coming to the story, some of them going directly to you. And I'm wondering what, what you have heard, because I'm seeing stories of people who are unable to get into the hospital for care that they need because of COVID patients taking up all the beds. Can you share a few of those that you've gotten with us? You bet. I mean, some of them are things that you might expect, people who need hip replacements or knee replacements. Uh, and it's just heartbreaking to read through their emails and see how much pain they're in and how they were really looking forward to this surgery. And then kind of the rug got pulled out from under them because uh, there's no availability to stay overnight or sometimes even to do just the day in and out surgery because there's no place to recover in there. Um, I've also heard from a woman who uh, has a feeding tube in her stomach and that she needs some surgery to help straighten that all out. That's waiting, she's hungry, she's in pain. Um, there's the hip replacements. Uh, I got an email from a man whose father has throat cancer and it's getting worse. A couple of colon cancers. Uh, it's just a wide variety of things that, you know, just sort of happen in life. But suddenly when you can't get in to get the hospital to get the surgery, it's a really big deal. 
And you got to remember, one uh, email was about a husband who had timed the surgery just perfect so that he could have all his vacation time when he recovered because it's a slow time in the business. Well, now that's not going to happen. So they think he's going to have to put it off until December or January when the next slow time comes around. You were so yeah, a lot of you were telling me lot of things going on there. Sure, you were telling me about one of the people at the hospital who has to make those calls and tell those patients that their their surgeries are being postponed or being canceled. Would you share that? Yes. So one of the emails I got was not from a patient, but from the patient coordinator. Uh, she, I think she worked at one of the large medical groups. And so she would be the person who would call you and say, OK, let's do your surgery three weeks from tomorrow. And here's all the things you need to do. And then as it got closer, OK, we're on track. Yep, everything's good. She was the person you coordinated with. And then she had to start making all the calls uh, in the spring when things got kind of crazy and cancel people. And then she made the following calls to reschedule them. And then she had to start making calls to cancel them again. And she yeah. said it was heartbreaking. Just person after person, you hear all their stories and how disappointed and sad they are. She finally quit that job and got out of the business because it was just too much for her. Unbelievable. All right. Pat Doris, thanks as always. You bet. My pleasure. Now, let's talk about one of our favorite topics here on the show, school boards. Seems like there's always a school board story to tell nowadays. You're probably familiar with one that's been going on in Newburgh. It's gotten national attention. Earlier this month, the school board voted to ban Black Lives Matter and pride signs and flags in schools. They claimed that these were political symbols and they wanted to keep politics out of the classroom. But a lot of people argue that those symbols had to do with people, not politics. And the school board didn't say that they had an issue with some of the other political signs in our culture. A bunch of people protested. The AC ACLU threatened to sue. The uh, AOC actually came and visited Newburgh. Well, now it looks like the board could go back on that decision. They're meeting tomorrow. And the first item on the agenda is rescind removal directive of BLM, Pride, and political signs ban. That meeting starts at 7 p.m., so we're going to be watching. Of course, we'll let you know what happens. There's also another item on that agenda that kind of caught our interest governor's mask mandate and local control options. Well, Sounds like Newburgh could be out of one controversy and right into another. Newburgh scored school district has said that they they'll follow Governor Brown's mask uh, requiring mandate uh, for K through 12 students to wear masks in school. But the school board has pushed back on that before with director Brian Shannon questioning the constitutionality of the governor's order. The state says if a district doesn't follow the mandate, they will be fined $500 a day until they compl comply to which the people in Adrian, Oregon said, wait, how much 500 now 500 bucks might seem like small potatoes to you, but if your whole town is smaller than the senior class at Newburgh high, a threat like that might get your attention or maybe not. It might not e either way last night. In a surprising, seemingly surprising move, the Adrian School Board fired the superintendent for obeying the state's mask mandate. Adrian's way over in Malheur County on the Oregon-Idaho border. Now keep in mind, this is a superintendent who personally was against the mandate, but he didn't want to break the mandate, didn't want to break the law here. He was so caught off guard by the decision and upset by the whole thing, he was tearing up during the meeting. Now, in this article from the Mauhir Enterprise, who covered it, it said that Kevin Purnell, the now former superintendent, has said he is not in favor of Governor Kate Brown's mandates, but he was described in public comments by Adrian residents as a, quote, rule follower who would enforce them anyway. He's a superintendent, by the way. They kind of they like to follow rules for the most part, right? For the past three years, he's been in charge of educating their kids, managing teachers, coaches, safety, transportation, etc. And apparently he wasn't enough of a wild card when it came to public health and state law. I spoke to the reporter who wrote that piece in the Malheur Enterprise, Liliana Frankel, about the decision to fire this man over masks. I think that the folks that oppose the masks do so because uh, of a variety of reasons. One is sort of this personal choice argument that is basically that the masks may be all good and well, but they should be allowed to choose whether or not they wear them. And then there's a second argument that is maybe a little more radical, which is that masks are harmful to children. We hear folks talking about how masks uh, hurt the development of English language learners who can't see their teachers' mouths move. We hear about how masks hurt um, students' social emotional development because they can't see their friends' faces. Um, all of that is not 
based in the same science that shows that masks are proven effective to reduce the transmission of coronavirus. And that is a point that is rarely addressed in these meetings. Right now, Maher County is seeing a surge in corona case, coronavirus cases. Its hospitals are filling up, the ICUs are overwhelmed, and consider that it, considering that it doesn't have some of the larger facilities and some of the larger, more populated areas do have, some of those patients are filling up the beds at other hospitals in Oregon and Idaho. Only 34% of eligible people are fully vaccinated in that area, which is one of the worst in the state. I personally am not sure where to expect this to go. Um, I think the school badly needs leadership in this moment. The community is very divided after this um, surprise firing and they need to be brought together. Um, the question is how can they do that when they don't have consensus on how they should be handling these sort of key issues around school protocols. As I was leaving, a man said to me, you must have a lot of work with this story. Um, you're going to have more work in the weeks to come because this is what happens. You're going to see a town completely torn apart. I just hate to hear that. And, you know, it's unclear who's going to be able to keep that district or that town intact through all of this. The board never said who they want to take over that job or if the person will be someone who opposes the mask mandate and actually does oppose it and doesn't make kids wear masks. Meantime, they still have to pay that guy who they just fired for the next six months and owe him almost $53,000. The good news is scientists think they've discovered a new group of rare whales. The bad news is the whales live in a huge patch of garbage floating in the Pacific Ocean. And with Louisiana suffering from the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, let's take a look back in the KGW vault when we sent a crew down to the Gulf Coast to cover Katrina. In New Orleans, I'm Pat Doris reporting. When the story continues. Welcome back. I always go through your questions and comments during the break. Keep sending them into the story at KGW.com or use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. I also want to remind everybody about our Hey Help campaign. This week we're asking you to please consider donating to Milk Crate Kitchen. They provide families in need with free meals. It started after a Portland chef lost his job during the pandemic. If you want to help them out, just hold your phone's, Q, uh, your phone's camera to the QR code on your screen. It'll take you to a donation page and you can also go to KGW.com slash HeyHelp to find a link. Now, usually when we have a story involving animals and garbage, it's pretty depressing as it would sound as it would be. Now, uh, no one uh, no one wants to think about the reality of how pollution is harming the world's wildlife. But this story is about something a little different. A group of Oregon researchers is heading out to a giant patch of garbage in the Pacific Ocean to try and find a whale that's never actually been seen alive before. Here's Keely Chalmers. It's known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a giant whirling garbage dump bigger than Texas out in the Pacific Ocean about halfway between Newport and Hawaii. Scientists discovered it more than a decade ago when the research expeditions to study the pool of plastic began. Many people have gone out there to study it for a variety of reasons. but most Lisa Balance was not one of those people, but she is a researcher. In fact, she's the director of the Marine Mammal Institute at Oregon State University, and she will be heading out to the garbage patch, but not because of the plastic. She and a team of researchers will be studying something else in the waters there. The goal of our expedition is to find um, a very cryptic, whale. While studying the Pacific plastic patch back in 2014, some researchers caught a glimpse of a species that had never been identified, at least not alive. They snapped quick photos with their cell phones. No one knew what they were, and gradually those photographs made their way to us in the Marine Mammal Institute. These are photos of the mysterious mammal. It's known as a beaked whale. It's about half the length of a gray whale. If you imagine a bottlenose dolphin, they have a, a, a nose like that. But they're very deep divers. They're oceanic. They are not social. They're shy of ships. And so not much is known about them. Balance and her team will be spending a month aboard the research vessel Pacific Storm to search for the whales. That is just so amazing and so exciting to know that there are still large animals 
out there that we know little to nothing about. They'll use super-powered binoculars, acoustic recorders, and hopefully some DNA sampling to first locate and then identify these mysterious creatures so we can eventually help protect them. By knowing uh, more about what's out there uh, and by knowing um, where they are, we can better understand how our impacts might uh, negatively affect those animals and, and what we can do about it. The research team will be documenting its entire month-long expedition online. We'll be following that research, too. We'll have a link to it on KGW.com. Keely Chalmers, KGW News. Last night on the story, we were talking about how Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana 16 years to the day after Hurricane Katrina hit. So we dug into the KGW vault. We found a bunch of stories that we did back in 2005 during the aftermath in New Orleans. Here's another one from Pat Doors. He's a little guy we rescued running down the street. We caught up with the Portland team just west of downtown New Orleans. They had just rescued two cats left behind by nurses at a hospital. But there is much more work ahead. Part of it simply navigating New Orleans tangled streets. This one has three power lines across the road. A man on a nearby roof tells them the address they're looking for does not exist. Hey, good luck to you. Thank you. Good luck to you. It's frustrating because the need is great. They're going to die without food and water. It's, it's hot in here, <laughs> so it's really hot. They decide to move on, but don't even reach the next location before spotting a door where someone wrote, Dogs Inside. Renee Pizzo, a Portland firefighter, and Carrie Tyler from the Oregon Humane Society will get the animals. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Oh, there's three. Yeah, there's three. There are three pit bulls chained and left inside this deserted building probably since the hurricane left 11 days ago. It doesn't appear like they have anything. They've no. eaten the couch. There's nothing. Yeah, I don't know how they've managed. The first dog is tangled. He's chained to the wall and tied to the couch. Renee cuts the chain and rope. Carrie wrestles the animal into a container. Eventually, they rescue all three animals. Animal rescuers like these have already picked up well over a thousand animals throughout New Orleans. These were not even on anybody's list and they worry there's a whole bunch more out there just like them. The Oregon team drives the dogs a few blocks away and delivers them to another crew who will take them on to the shelter. But team leader Randy Covey says the sad fact is many pets will die. There's going to be some sad stories. There's going to be animals that are dying. Um, it's, it's, it's not because we don't want to get to them. We're doing the best we can. If I could just share one thing with people that know or suspect that there, there might be a natural disaster headed their way, it's when you evacuate, take your pets with you. Take your pets with you when you evacuate. And they're going through all of that again. You got to feel for the people down in that part of the country. If you have any ideas for the KGW Vault, got a lot of stuff down there. Let me know. Use that hashtag, hey Dan. Meantime, keep sending me your questions and comments. I'll read a few when we finish the story. Next. All right, let's read some comments. Toby said, I look forward to your show for local issues. Tonight is really anything but. Had to turn you off. Toby. Toby. He turned, when did he tweet that? 621. You missed the Pat Doris vault. That was about Louisiana. So I'm, I'm, you're accurate, but now you're missing me talk about your, your comment. So you should never turn us off, ever. Uh, and just to prove that we'll stay local, let me talk about a congresswoman from New York. Uh, during, uh, Paul wrote in, during the Newburgh school piece, did you really say that AOC had visited town? Really? I suppose that's plausible, but one would think you'd show video of the New York congresswoman. Um, he's asking, did I mispronounce or misread ACLU? No, it was AOC. Pull up the tweet. There she is. So this is a tweet sent by Ryan Clark, who is somebody who's been a, a journalist who's been on our show before. He's from the Newburgh Graphic. And apparently, according to his tweet, AOC was in town vacationing in Oregon and uh, swung through Newburgh. But there she is in the middle, I think. 
masks on, sorry to tell, but that's her. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Keep the questions coming in, the comments coming in. Uh, again, sometimes I address them at the end of the show. Sometimes we send a reporter to research it and get a hold of you and try to dig into it further, as you can see if you watch us on a regular basis. So please keep those questions coming. Even if we're not on the air, we're always looking at our, our inbox and trying to work for you. So thanks for being with us. That's the story for tonight. See you back in tomorrow.